Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us. From Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Reverend Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Reverend Howard Caesar. I love the story about the Lutheran pastor who some years back he would uh, always start each service off, uh, his worship service, with the phrase, the Lord be with you. And then the people in the congregation would all respond back to him, and also with you. Well, one Sunday, the sound system wasn't working very well. And uh, that particular Sunday, the pastor stepped up to the pulpit and said, there's something wrong with this microphone. And the people responded, and also with you. <laughs> <laughs> words are uh, very important. I love you are powerful words. I love you. Um, also, two words that are familiar uh, and are often used are high and low. You know, and when we speak uh, about spirituality and about spiritual consciousness, I think we all want to go higher uh, rather than lower. Higher is better. And uh, when people talk about getting high on life, unfortunately, sometimes getting high has the connotation of some synthetic or, you know, drugs or pills or some other means. But today, I want to talk to you about the healthiest, purest, most natural, spiritual way to get high uh, in life. And uh, we're obviously talking about love, because if, if you read or uh, noticed, my title today is Getting High on love, getting high on love. And really, love, uh, hopefully you all understand, is, is a vibration and a frequency, and nothing is more pure it, that, as a vibration that links us to the divine. That when you are really opening to the vibration and the frequencies of love moving through you, uh, you really are uh, attuned to the divine. Uh, you feel the divine. You feel connected to the divine. It's, there's nothing higher that a person can move into energetically and spiritually. We say that God is love, and when, when we abide in love, we abide in God. And to abide in means to tune in. You're tuned in. You're on that frequency. You dialed it up. It's like you do a radio station. And instead of getting noise, you're getting something beautiful that's moving through you. And you can feel it. And you know when you've tuned into it versus other frequencies that life can throw at you. And uh, People sometimes, you know, speak of having a yearning inside, um, a yearning, and sometimes they aren't sure what that yearning is about, and other times uh, it is a yearning that they would describe as a yearning for love, a yearning for peace, a, learning, a yearning for harmony or uh, freedom, a yearning for loving relationships. Some of you know that, uh, as I've shared on other occasions, my wife Diane and I live on a little lake and it's attached to another lake. It's like a figure eight. And so in between the two lakes is like a little walkway. And there's all houses on the other lake, and on ours there's just about five homes, and the rest of the lake is all nature. And uh, it's up against a, a, a park that's a couple hundred acres. And so a lot of wildlife and waterfowl there, and uh, neat things, blue herons and pelicans and mariettas, pink spoonbills, and all these other fancy names. I have a book at home. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, anyway, on the other lake, there is typically two big white swans, and they kind of stay over on that other lake, for whatever reason. And um, a month or so ago, uh, the one swan uh, disappeared, and there was only one left. And recently, that one that has been left has been kind of, you know, flying over our lake. And every once in a while, we see that swan 
uh, just kind of swimming around in our lake. And so recently, um, you know, because this swan is lonely. And uh, the other day there was a big white pelican that was in our lake. And it was out there and it was floating. It was near the shoreline, but it was in the water and just kind of stationary. And uh, the swan all of a sudden flew over and saw the pelican, the big white pelican, this big white swan. And it landed about 30 feet away. And then Diane and I watched as this swan began to make advances <laughs> toward the pelican. It was swimming towards it, and it was fluffing up its, you know, and doing all of that mating gestures. And it was slowly going closer and closer to the um, pelican. And uh, the poor swan didn't know it was a pelican and that it was a swan, or maybe it didn't care. It was just... <laughs> And, uh, but unfortunately, the pelican did care. And as it grew, got closer, uh, the pelican just took off, took off. Um, so apparently, all creations have yearnings for loving relationships. You know, we've been told that the ultimate question that we are all looking to answer in life is, who am I? Who am I? You know, and the Greeks said, in essence, that the purpose of our existence is to know thyself. And all the yearnings, basically, that one has of love or for love or peace or joy or freedom or whatever it may be, they're really fulfilled when you answer the question of who, I, who am I? And when you answer that question and then be that, all the yearnings are fulfilled, really. And it is coming to know that basically love is who we are. All yearnings are really a way through love. And we're just in the process of learning how to really get high on love. And that's a process, really. And uh, we get high as love, as, uh, as opposed to on love, really. And uh, so we're all still learning uh, what love really is. And we're all learning still you know, what it is that we have to be letting go of in our lives to be able to let love show up more. Because really, love advances uh, as a result of things that we are letting go of, all the things that stand in the way. That's a, that's a process. And so it's a journey. And, uh, you know, there's some wonderful writings, actually, that you're familiar with uh, biblically, that um, the treatise on love by Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he has some very specific things to say if you've ever read slowly through it and really reflected on it and meditated on it. And you're familiar with this, but let's just go over it a little bit. Uh, it starts out with, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. As if that's not good. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Nothing. That's pretty harsh, pretty strong. All of that going on, all those gifts, you're still nothing without love. And it doesn't mean if I'm not receiving love, I'm nothing. It means really... If I have not love to give and flow through me, I am nothing. And he continues on, and he says, love never fails. That's a powerful thing. No matter what it is you may be facing, if you can hang out in love, let no circumstance or situation take you out of love, you know, because love will never fail you. As for prophecy, they shall fail. As for tongues, they shall cease. As for knowledge it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. What he's saying is that basically knowledge, intellectual stuff, you know, it's incomplete. It's imperfect. It only take you so far. Prophesying, same thing. It's incomplete. All these different things, imperfect. And then Paul says, but, but, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Very important. Very important to get what's being said here. Love is something that is being perfected in us all. 
and we get parts and pieces of it, but there is the, the perfect, and he goes on to talk more about what that is. He continues and he says it's more like maturing, that you all mature into love. You know, you don't just get there right away, you're learning and maturing. He says, when I was a child, you know, I spoke as a child and I understood as a child and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So we grow up in love. We grow up out of foolish illusions of what love is. We grow up out of thinking it's, you know, we have it really in parts and pieces, but we don't have the whole. And so it's a process that we're going through. And he goes on to say, for we know, for, for now, he says, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. I like that sentence. And if we were to add to that sentence two words, by God, makes even more sense. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known by God. God knows who you are. You don't know that. We're still waking up to that. We're still waking up to the idea that we are held to be in the mind of God. How we were created to be, being given free will. We're kind of circling on back, growing and evolving into the love that we were created from and in and as. And that's a process that we're all on a journey of. So we're talking about growing up spiritually to the place where you come to realize beyond, beyond a child's perception of love being outside oneself, to the place where you grasp, begin to grasp, that you are love. That love is what I am. Wow, to be with that. And if you really identify with it and get that that's what you are and begin to be it, your whole life is transformed. It's all different. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall come face to face with our true nature, face to face with what God sees us to be. And actually face to face means we will see in everyone's face God. It's like the song we just sung, Imagine. It won't be anywhere you look that you don't see God face to face. Very powerful verses here that Paul's talking about. Now I know in part, and the part I know that's only a piece or a part of what love is, is that that part is that I, love feels good and, and I want more of it, you know? And I tend to believe that it comes from outside of me when it really comes from within. And so one has to mature and grow up out of some of those illusions. You know, in her autobiography, The Story of My Life, Helen Keller tells how as a deaf and blind child, she learned from Anne Sullivan the meaning of love. Very interesting. Deaf and blind learning the meaning of love. How would you like that? Pretty tough. And she remembered, Helen Keller, back to a particular morning in which she first asked the meaning of the word love. And she, Helen had found some violets in the garden and she brought them to her teacher, Ann Sullivan, and Ann Sullivan was moved, and he tr she tried to kiss Helen, and Helen would not be allowed to have anyone kiss her but her mother. And so then Miss Sullivan put her arm gently around Helen and spelled into her hand, I love Helen. I love Helen. And Helen Keller signed back, what is love? She didn't know. She was young. And Miss Sullivan drew Helen closer to her and took her hand and formed a, a, you know, a pointed finger and directed it and touched her heart and said, it is here. And that puzzled Helen Keller because up to that point she did not understand anything that you could not touch. And that Miss Sullivan was trying to talk about an energy uh, that was formless. And uh, so Helen smelled the violets in her hand, and then she asked, uh, half in words and half in signing, is love the sweetness of flowers? And Miss Sullivan said, no, no, it's not. And then um, Helen felt the warm sun shining on her face, and she said, is, th is this not love? And then, no, no. 
And then it was, you jump ahead a couple of days, really, a day or two later, and the sun had been behind the clouds, and there had been a couple of brief showers, uh, and suddenly the sun broke through in all of its glory, and uh, Helen, this was still on her mind, and at that moment when the sun came out, Helen said, is this not love? She was still asking, wanting to understand. And her teacher replied in, and conveyed in this way, with words and signing, basically said, love is something like the clouds that were in the sky before, before the sun came out. You cannot touch the clouds, but you feel the rain, and you know how glad the flowers and the thirsty earth are to have it after a hot day. You cannot touch love either, she said, but you feel the sweetness that it pours into everything. Without love, Helen, you would not be happy or even want to play. And it was that, that moment that some sense of the truth of what love is burst into Helen Keller's awareness, and she communicated back that she felt that love was invisible lines that stretched between her spirit and the spirit of others. That's pretty profound for a little girl who's been blind and deaf to get. Invisible lines that stretch from my spirit to the spirit of others. Very powerful. Love is a unifying force. She felt that. Connects all to God and all to an energy. She felt the energy and she sensed that it no longer had to be something she touched physically. It was invisible lines. I love that. She was learning and maturing in her experience of understanding what love is. Growing up in love, if you will. Now people go looking for love as though it's something to be found outside themselves, you know. But you know, love can't be found. Love has to be uncovered from within. And uh, you have to come to the place where you know love is what you are. It's not something you're searching to find necessarily. You're, you're searching to be. Um, and so God is love, and we are made in the image and after the likeness of God. And we are individualized expressions of God. We are made in the image and after the likeness. We are individualized expressions of God. And if God is love, then so are we. And you get that? We can't be anything else. When I was in, in India, one of the things they would have you say was like about a series of ten statements, but um, amongst them was, um, I am not my mind, I am not my thoughts, I am not my body, I am love. It's like getting away from any other identity but you are love. It was very powerful, you see. The Bible states God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. That's in 1 John. And that's a very powerful verse. To abide in God is to abide in love. To abide in love is to abide in God. Very powerful. And it's an experience that is so holy and so pure and so powerful that the only way that Paul could define that was to make it analogous to being face to face with God. You know, and he said, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. It's so like in the morning, getting up and the shower has made the mirror misty and you wipe it clean and there you are. You're clear. It's kind of like that. Love is its own reward. You can't wait around for it to show up. You can wait a long time. You have to be it. And when you be it and, and choose to be who you are, it seems to be just flowing all around you back at you because life is a mirror. Love between two people is a beautiful thing. But whether a person is in a committed relationship or not, to see clearly into the mirror is to know that our sense of wholeness doesn't come from another. It always starts within oneself. Psychologists tell us that unhealthy relationships are built on an unhealthy sense of need well, that's on some level, consciously or unconsciously, we're saying, I need you. I'm not complete without you. And then we enter into fear within the dynamic of the relationship. And then it's about survival. And our survival is threatened. And fear gets mixed up in the way of really love. And it's a feeling that I'm not whole and complete on my own. 
and I'm looking somewhere to someone to fill up my emptiness. And so the ideal is for two people to be working on becoming whole, supporting each other in being whole, seeing each other as whole even when they may not be, and bringing as much of that wholeness to the relationship as possible, celebrating life together, celebrating being together from a place of wholeness, from a place of security that comes from within, from a place of self-worth and love instead of fear. Somewhere last week on a TV station, I happened to be walking through the room and they highlighted a discussion that went on between a man who was terminally ill and dying and his wife. And basically the, the wife said, what am I going to do without you? And the commentators, and it was like a, a team of commentators, said that the man said back to the wife, you're going to take the love you have for me and spread it around. That's what you're going to do. And the partner was saying, yes, you may grieve at, at the loss, but then you can't stop living and you can't stop loving because you are whole within yourself. So it is our mission and our purpose to love, to love life, to love those who come in and out of our life, and why don't we love more? Why is it hard uh, sometimes to give love? Well, one big reason is basically <laughs> we don't love ourselves. And all love from us passes through the screens of how we hold ourselves. And so if we don't know that we are love, it's going to be hard for that love to pass through. And that's why a lot of love is letting go of what stands in the way. We cannot give to others what we do not have ourselves. And that's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. The only way you're going to be able to love your neighbor or the people around you is when you get to the place where you love yourself and then you'll be able to love them as you love yourself. Because that's the way it's going to be anyway. All right? Um, what keeps us out of love is basically an element of the, of the mind, the separate self, you know, that basically the mind carrying on a constant commentary and conversation, being in some kind of conflict, uh, comparing and judging and evaluating and measuring ourselves and others. And Ann Sullivan took the finger and pointed not to the head of Helen, but to the heart. See, it's all about the heart. We cannot be loving toward ourselves if we are always in our minds. If we're always weighing and judging and comparing ourselves. I like to say that the ego's playground is the mind. And the mantra of the ego is, I'm not good enough. And then it's hard to love. If you let the mind rule, you have to find your way to the heart. If we focus on our faults and flaws and mistakes, that's what we will do with others. You know, if we accept ourselves unconditionally and really work on that, we're likely to love and accept others unconditionally. It's the way it goes. You know, we're in the Olympics now, and one of the things we should enter into is our own Olympics of love, you know, and, 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 and bringing forth a perfecting of love in ourselves. They perfect themselves in the various events that they're in. Well, we need to be perfecting ourselves in this journey of life and perfected in love. And an Olympian, an Olympian never wants to focus on his or her mistakes and carry them into the performance at all and into the life of the performance. So the key for the Olympics of love that we may be living is to not focus on our past mistakes or on the mistakes of our partners or on others. We stay in the moment. We leave the bad baggage behind. We let go of all the limitations of the past. There was a man that had a dream, and he was living uh, miserable because he was so caught up in the mistakes of his past. And then he had a dream. In this vivid dream, he was ushered into a room where there was like a council of judge, judges. And he thought that this was his judgment day. This isn't a dream he had, OK? And, um, he started babbling and reciting all the things that he had done wrong and how he was sorry and didn't mean to do them and begging for forgiveness and he just rambled on and then all of a sudden he kind of looked around and saw that everybody was just really not paying attention to him. You know, uh, they were disinterested. Finally he shut up. And when he did, the head guy looked at him and said, all we wish to ask you is, have you completed that which you were there to do and be? And he woke up. And the dream was a gift to him. It was telling him, get out of the past, get out of your mistakes, 
yeah, learn from them, but now be who you need to be in the moment. It's the only place that love and God is. It's the only place they live. And so he got that his mission was to love and to be love. And so if we're going to go on a high in love, we have to do a couple of things. We have to strengthen a couple of things in ourselves, at least two areas. And one is to live in the moment. You know, it's the only place that God is. And, you know, love gets pushed away by fear, uh, by insecurities. And, and, and fear has us, obviously, always in the past or the future, out of the moment. It's of the head, not of the heart. So we need to be in the moment. Just realize when we're not in it. That's a discipline. Secondly, we have to really strengthen our sense that ah, love is who we are. Love is who I am. You know, uh, affirm that. I, because this lesson was coming up, I was affirming that for myself this week, several days. And when I was driving and when I'd get up in the morning, I'd affirm, I am love, I am love. And um, even at the gym, I go to the gym now uh, three times a week and, and I'm on the elliptical machine and I'm going, I am love, I am love. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just anywhere I could ingrain that. And the thing that I noticed is, you know, and I'm still part I'm not perfected in love. I promise you I'm not. But the thing by saying I, love, I am love, I am love, I am love, and identifying with that, first it begins to bring up for you an awareness of where you're not being love. You notice yourself where you're, where you're not being it. And then from there it will move you forward toward being it and expressing it. But it's a process, really, I found. <clears throat> so it's cumulative. It builds you into the consciousness of all of a sudden living from it, being from it, feeling it, living. You're tuned into the frequency of who you are and the life that you were given to live. So would you repeat after me? Would you repeat after me? Okay. I am love. Together? I am love. Again, I am love. Now feel it in your heart. I am love. Just get a sense that God is saying and living, the God in you is saying, I am love. And then, of course, because we're all one family, and we're all one, let us say, we are love. Together? We are love. One more time. We are love. This week, begin the process in you of getting high on love, moving into the higher frequencies and vibrations, tuning in to the divine that you were created to be. A person is only as happy as they are able to be loving. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org. Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us.